Let's turn back to Psalm 104 as we begin looking at the Holy Spirit. When we think of the Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, I think I'm safe in saying that the Holy Spirit is the one we know least about. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's work is like the wind. We can see the wind's effects, but we can't see the wind itself. And so it is with the Holy Spirit that we may be aware of what he does, but his work seems mysterious and subtle, and it can be a hard, uh, it's hard to get a firm grip of what he exactly does. And that tends to lead to a lot of misunderstanding. Some forget that as God, that the Holy Spirit is a person, and we call him he. Uh, he's a person, not a thing. He's not an impersonal force like something from Star Wars. He's not a life force that's present in everything. He's not a something to be manipulated. He's the sovereign Lord. And in the Nicene Creed, which was written in AD 325, he is described as the Lord and giver of life. The Lord and giver of life. And so even Christians can be mistaken when we relegate him to a certain function. Uh, we can think of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and we know of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we might think then that all he does is within us. He saves us, he gifts us, he grows us, and that's it. Or worse still, we think that only charismatic Christians are interested in the Holy Spirit, and that might mean we distance ourselves and effectively ignore the Spirit. So I thought over the next few weeks we'd spend some time concentrating on who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And today I want to focus on the sort of the, the big picture, the cosmic dimensions of his work. And what I mean by that is that rather than looking at what he does within us, which we'll do over the next few weeks, we're going to look at his work in creation as the Lord and giver of life. We'll look at his work of giving life to creation and then his work at giving new life, preparing for the new creation. So in Genesis 1 and verse 2, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters of the empty and formless world brooding over it like a mother hen, ready to bring life and form and order out of the chaotic formlessness. And so in Psalm 33, we read, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. In Hebrew, there's only one word for breath, wind and spirit. We thought a few weeks ago, how about there's, uh, there's a lots of words for some Hebrew words, but this time they've got one word that can mean breath, wind, and spirit. And so when we read that God does something by the breath of his mouth, we then understand that as an action of the Holy Spirit. God spoke, the Holy Spirit brings it into being. And so when we turn over to Genesis 2 and see the creation of humanity, we again see the work of the Spirit as the breath of God. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The Holy Spirit gives life. He breathes into Adam's nostrils, and that dust, that mud, springs to life. In the book of Job, Elihu testifies in chapter 33 that the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. So not only did the Holy Spirit give life to the first human being, but every one of us alive at this moment is alive because the Holy Spirit gives us breath. Again, in chapter 34 of Job, we read, And if it was God's intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish together and man would return to the dust. So not only does he give us life, he sustains our life as well. The fact that we are all here today, alive and breathing, is because of the Holy Spirit's powerful work. We rely on him for every moment of our life. And every single one of the seven billion people on earth is alive because of the Spirit's ongoing work. Now, what incredible power he has. Not only has he brought life to all of us, he sustains our life moment by moment, all seven billion of us. What intimate knowledge he has of each one of us, that he knows and enlivens each one. 
and that each breath that we take is a gift from God the Holy Spirit. You know, the grace that he shows by sustaining us in that way. So you look around today and every person you see is being kept alive and sustained by the Holy Spirit out of his great love and mercy. And he's doing that for 7 billion other people, a large percentage of whom are actively rebelling against him. That's grace. Yeah, like Elihu said, he could well withdraw and all of us would cease to live in an instant. But he doesn't do that. What a great God he is. But his greatness doesn't stop there. Now, I've only been speaking about 7 billion people. The Holy Spirit also sustains the billions upon billions of other life forms on this planet. That's what we saw there in Psalm 104, that meditation on what God is doing in creation and how the Holy Spirit brings and gives and ends life and renews the face of the earth. So the writer, as he reads through here, meditating on creation, realising that not only there are a vast number of land animals, but there are myriads of creatures in the sea, all created and sustained by God. What does the psalm say? How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There's a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created. And when you knew the face of the earth. When their breath is taken away, creatures die. The spirit recreates and new generations of animals and humans are born. When we see the explosion of new life each spring, when we see the bounty of summer, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. His great creative power produces an abundance of life. It's almost too much life to take in. I promised England illustrations. Here's my first one. So on the second day that Owen and I were in England, we went uh, on a walk to find a folly. Now, a folly is uh, like a thing, <laughs> a, a structure, uh, built by eccentric landowners for no particular reason, just to do it. So we thought we'd go and find it. And to find it, we had to walk along a bridle path, which is like a sunken footpath between two fields that's like a public access way uh, through the farms. And it was hemmed in by two really tall hedges. And they were so thick, you just couldn't see through them. The sun was warm in a clear sky, but the morning breeze was still cool. Uh, the hedges were thick, the blackberry had woven itself through them, and they were heavy with, uh, with their fruit. There were many insects buzzing and birds flittering and singing through the hedge. We got to scare the occasional rabbit as we went along and we finally came to the folly, which wasn't that much uh, at the end, <laughs> but it was nice. Right there was a group of sycamore trees which we sat under and uh, that cool morning breeze made the sycamore seed sort of helicopter down to earth. We looked out over field after field of crops and they were divided by more hedgerows and clumps of forest and it just felt so English that we had to FaceTime Catherine and, and Aaron to, to uh, show them. They were on the opposite side of the planet and had just come back in from Cat Cabarita Headland watching whales uh, leap and splash for joy. You know, they were just watching the surface of the ocean. If they sort of dipped their heads underneath, they would have seen another creation altogether down there, full of fish and crabs and eels and sharks and coral and seaweed and starfish and anemones, just in a superabundance. Everything that has life, from those tiny insects in the hedge in England to the humpback whale on the opposite side of the planet off Australia, is given life by the Holy Spirit. When we spend time in creation, we realise that we are moving in a mystery. We are walking in the field of the Spirit who is creating and sustaining and recreating and moving, shaping the entire universe and moving it toward its goal. And Paul says in Athens, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
The Holy Spirit is always present everywhere. Everything we do, everything we are, is acted out within his presence. So he's not just some force out there, but a living presence actively involved in all of the universe. Yeah, what we saw in England and the girls saw in Australia was just part of his wonderful work. And science over the years has observed and began to understand the order and the interconnectedness and the purposefulness of creation. And only until fairly recently we're happy to attribute all of that to the wisdom and power of the Lord and giver of life. It's not the mindless mechanics of chance, but the infinite wisdom and superabundant life-giving power of God the Holy Spirit who shapes and governs all life on this planet. We go out into the world and we see his creative majesty. And he's doing that in every square centimetre of the planet. And we could ask, after all that, well, why? Why is there creation at all? Maybe that's like asking, well, why are there paintings or why are there symphonies? You know, creation isn't necessary. God didn't need to create us. But creation expresses God's creative delight. And it demonstrates his pleasure in everything from spiders to galaxies and he takes delight in everything that he has made. God is pleased to make room for the creation, for the, cre the creature. His overflowing, generous nature wants to create us and for us to delight in him and in all that he has made, to give him glory. He loves relationships and he's made us to enjoy him and all that he has made forever. And because we have been granted a spirit, we are able to communicate with God and enjoy what he has done. We watch a sunset or a sunrise and we recognise it's not really just a matter of light rays scattered and broken up on particles of air. It's the work of the Holy Spirit taking delight in these extravagant displays of his goodness, doing it day after day without getting tired. He graces the whole world with gifts of life and he gives us life to marvel at it and to enjoy it with him. So every time we wake up, every time we watch birds or mammals, every time we see order and form being brought out of chaos, we're watching the work of the Holy Spirit. But his work doesn't stop there. God the Holy Spirit is powerfully and extravagantly at work in creation but he's also powerfully and extravagantly at work in recreation. So in Genesis 1, we saw the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, God speaking words of creation. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, the Holy Spirit hovers over the waters of the Jordan and descends on Jesus as God the Father speaks words initiating the new creation. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus. The Holy Spirit empowered Jesus for ministry. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit convicts people of sin and brings about the new birth. Jesus explains that in, verse, in John 3. He says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. He calls people, he gives them new birth out of his sovereign mercy. We cannot enter the kingdom of God unless he's at work in our hearts. And he's free to work when and where and how he pleases. Sometimes he does that very quietly as a child grows up in a Christian home and in their faith. Sometimes he does it spectacularly as uh, someone deep in rebellion against God or lost in their own wretchedness is suddenly turned around and brought to new life. Sometimes, often, he does it in ones and twos. 
Sometimes he does it in such a great outpouring of his grace that it converts entire towns or even entire islands. Sometimes he uses ordinary means like preaching and reading the Bible. Other times he uses extraordinary means like dreams or incredibly powerful coincidences. And in his sovereignty, he can even use a series of events and conversations over years to bring about that new birth for a person. And he enables Christians to be able to speak about Jesus to others. He directs us where to go to speak. He gives us words to say. And he brings about conviction in our hearers' hearts. The Holy Spirit is not only for charismatic Christians. He is actively working in every Christian's life to bring about that new life, a new creation. And so, every single one of us here today is alive because of the Holy Spirit. Every single believer here today has been made truly alive through his work. We have been recreated through him. And millions upon millions of people alive today have been brought to new life through him. It's estimated that 3,000 people a day are being born again. So not only does the Holy Spirit sustain and enliven every single creature on earth, every single microsecond of the day, but he simultaneously recreates thousands of people every day. Can his mercy and his power know no bounds? And so just as he's moving the entire creation toward its goal, he's moving believers toward our goal. He's growing those millions upon millions to be more like Jesus each one in our own unique way. We'll think about that more in weeks to come. So how do we respond to that? How do we respond to the, the, this cosmic dimension of the Spirit's work, bringing life in all that he does? Like, Well, for me, I just can't look at creation in the same way again. Every time I look around me, I see the Holy Spirit at work his powerful, creative majesty in all that he does. And I can find delight in that just as he does. I can thank him for it and I can praise his holy name. And I can be aware that God is not somewhere out there, but he's here, right here. David's words in Psalm 139 give me great comfort. Where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? The Holy Spirit is always with us. Everywhere we go, he is there. And because he created us, he knows all our thoughts and actions. He's familiar with all our ways. We are known by God, not just those who don't have any known grave in France and Belgium. Every one of us is known by God. And because of the new life that the Holy Spirit has given each one of us as believers... We can know him. So truly we do live and move and have our being in him, the Holy Spirit. He's not only the agent of creation, he's the agent of recreation as he transforms millions and gives them new birth. So be on the lookout for his work this week. Be ready to praise and thank him each morning for the new gift of life that he's given you. Be open to his call on your life and in the direction that he gives. Next week we'll consider how he comes alongside and within each believer as our comforter. But let's, in thinking on that, let's come before God in prayer. And I'll use the words of an old hymn as the prayer. Let's pray. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light, Lord of all, to thee we raise this, our hymn of grateful praise. We praise you, Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life. Amen.